Lord willing, it will be the message that he wants for us to hear and that uh, we will receive a word from him. So normally, whenever you're teaching like in a group, you should avoid reading for too long. People kind of lose interest and kind of fade away. But this is a story that requires a little bit of reading, and so I'm going to kind of lay it for you, um, give you a little bit of the background. So we're going to be looking at the story of three Jewish guys, and their Jewish names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are part of a group of Jewish people that were taken away from the kingdom of Judah in the Babylonian captivity. So Israel, as they had faded away, as they had drifted, after Solomon's rule, the kingdom splits. And you have the northern kingdom, and it kind of never really goes back towards the Lord. You know, it starts down the wrong path, and it has some terrible kings along the way. You get um, Jezebel, you know, is a queen in this era. You get um, Ahab. You just get some terrible people, and they wind up going into captivity earlier. After being warned from the Lord multiple times, hey, you need to turn it around. Elijah spends most of his time in the northern kingdom. He calls down fire from heaven. He slays the prophets of Baal. So there's all of this activity. Judah stays faithful for longer. It has a mix of good kings and bad kings. They'd get a couple bad kings, they'd get a good king, and they'd go back and forth. And as the kingdom kind of disintegrated down, the Babylonians come. They rise up as the predominant power in the region. You know, After the Assyrians have come to the Babylonians, and they show up, and they start carting off the riches of the kingdom of Judah, from Jerusalem, they start taking the gold, the valuables, the jewelry, and they start taking the best and the brightest from the nation of Judah into captivity. And it starts with a group of like 10,000 of the best and the brightest, the king's court, the most well-educated, all of the nobility, the elite, they wind up getting taken. And that's the group that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they would have been part of that first group that gets deported. And the goal really for the Persian Empire, for the Babylonians, was this sort of cultural assimilation. They had won, they're bringing them there, and you know they really want to, through education and through sort of cultural influence, to sort of get the Jewishness out of them, turn them into useful, productive citizens for their kingdom. And that's sort of the goal. And they wind up doing it very well because not that many Jews return. You know, when you look at the end of the captivity a few hundred years later, you know, and the number that return versus the number that stay and stay settled in, you know, what is modern day Iran, and they stay settled there all the way up until the state of Israel is created. You know, and at that point, a lot of them are expelled, but a lot of them stay for a very long time. But there is this group of them And Daniel and these three, they refuse to do the assimilation. In Daniel chapter 1, we see that they are brought into the king's court and they got the big buffet. You know, the first thing is they got the spread of all the king's food. And they see the unclean, the detestable, the food that they don't want to eat, the pig, the shellfish, the whatever it is, and it's not kosher. And they look at them and they go, hey, we're really not, we don't want to eat that. Can we just eat the vegetables? And like the guy in charge is like, well, you know, if you guys don't look good and you get thin and you get unhealthy, you know, it's going to be my head and, you know, I'll get killed. And they're like, well, just test us in it. Give us some time and, you know, see if the Lord isn't faithful. And sure enough, 10 days later, they're healthier. They look more vigorous. They're stronger than all the people that have been eating whatever. And so the Lord blesses their faithfulness right away. And so they're fine with it and they let them go. And then in Daniel chapter 2, we see Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And he goes to all of his officials, his sorcerers, his satraps, his astrologers, all of these people that predict the future, his whole group, and he goes, hey, I had a dream. 
and I want to know what the dream was and what it means. And they're like, well, you got to tell us about the dream and then we'll interpret it. And he goes, no, that's a scam. You know, if I, if I got to tell you what it is, then, you know, how, you don't really know. You're just coming up with something. So you got to tell me. And he's like, well, nobody's ever done that. We can't do that. And so he goes, well, if you don't, I'm just going to put you all to death. I'm going to knock your houses over. We're going to turn it all into rubble. I'm going to purge you all. And so he dispatches his soldiers and he starts getting ready to kill these guys. And they come to Daniel and Daniel finds out what's going on. And he goes, well, give me a day. Let me, let me pray over it. Let me see. And so Daniel goes to Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, and they pray. And the Lord gives Daniel the wisdom to know what the dream was. And the dream was about a statue that represents the future and these different kingdoms that are going on, that are going to happen, starting with this one, and then after them, the Assyrians, or the Medes and Persians, and then the Romans, the Greeks, all these different, it's a prediction of the future. And for a moment, we see Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of chapter 2, he is absolutely amazed that Daniel knows. He says, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. And he is a guy that comes so close to seeing God. You know, and a lot of people have that experience where. They get sick and they pray for a miracle and maybe they get healed or they have a crisis and they go, Lord, if you'll deliver me from this, I'll change my life. Or, you know, Lord, help me in this and then I will, you know, live for you. And then the moment is over, the crisis is averted and the remembrance of the miracle fades. And before you know it, they're back to doing what they were always doing before. And it's amazing how that can happen. You know, you think about Judas. He literally walked with Jesus for three years. And yet, somehow he could kiss the doorway to heaven and still miss it. And so each of us chooses. And so Nebuchadnezzar has this moment where he sees the power of God, but yet it doesn't stick. He promotes Daniel. Daniel becomes in charge of everybody. He's like the top guy. He's Joseph in Egypt. He winds up being in charge of the whole deal. He's the only one he has to answer to, and he's in top charge of it all. And then he makes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the top governors over the area of Babylon, which is going to create a little ill will for all the native Babylonian nobles that were like, hey, who are these guys? And now they're in charge. You know, that's going to create some problems. And so chapter 3 opens up, and it's, a, it's so quick. Because you've got verse 49 in chapter 2 where all of a sudden he's put these guys over everything. And then in chapter 3 it opens up with Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, which is about 90 feet um, tall. And it was 6 cubits, which is roughly, I wrote that down somewhere, like 9 feet, give or take. Um, wide by nine feet deep. So think more of an obelisk than a statue. You know, think more Washington Monument and not just like a statue of a person. And it's about 90 feet tall, which is roughly an 11 story building. If you were driving around Memphis and you were to go past the Crescent Center on Poplar at Ridgeway, it's about that tall. So this is a big statue. And he builds this thing and he orders it to be plated with gold. And you have to wonder, that's a lot of gold. You know, where did he get it from? And likely, it's the gold from the temple. You know, they have sacked Jerusalem. They have taken, the whole temple was plated with gold on the inside. There were gold ornaments. There were gold objects. So it's very likely that this holy, sacred gold that had been in the temple all of a sudden gets carted off, melted down, and winds up being used to build an idol, which is probably greatly offensive to the Lord on top of the offense of building an idol. And so he builds this thing, and it says that Nebuchadnezzar sends word to the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication. So they're having a ribbon-cutting ceremony. They're unveiling the image, 
and he's called in all of his top officials, all of his chief administrators, anybody that was anybody in the Babylonian kingdom has been ordered to come to the launching event, and he orders that they are going to have to bow down and worship this statue when there is the sound, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the people and nations and men, every language, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So he's enforcing this universal religion. He has created an idol. And he is mandating that all of his people bow down and worship him. And there's a lot of people there that were conquered from other regions that had their own idols, that had their own gods. And then you have all of these Jewish people, at least 10,000, maybe tens of thousands that were there. And they're all there, and they're all about to bow down and worship. And, you know, they may not have believed that this thing was God. They may not have believed that it was a powerful object, but... They didn't want to get killed either, you know, and so they all agree and they're going to bow down to the thing. I find it hard to imagine that everybody that was there had to think. I mean, you know, you got people that built the thing, you know, there was somebody up there that was sculpting his nose, you know, Bill's up there making his nose and doing the thing. And, you know, then all of a sudden he's got to bow down and worship the thing and he's looking up there going, you know, hey, I built that. You know, it's hard to imagine that they could have that much reverence for it. But at the same time, they don't want to get killed either. So they all just sort of go with the program. Now, it's interesting that when we look at the object, we see that there are sixes all over the place. The dimensions of the object are 60 cubits tall by 6 wide by 6 deep. you got three sixes. It's sort of a four shadowing of what we see in Revelation 13 with the image of the beast. And then you look at the instruments that are played, and there's six of them. And so we see all of these sixes all over the place, which is the number for man, and three sixes is the number for Antichrist, the just slightly less perfect than God. And so we see man, we see Satan all over this thing. And as he enforces this universal religion, they all bow down. But there are three that don't. They don't say anything. They don't object. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't launch a protest. or like, hey, we're not going to do it. They just quietly don't kneel. While everybody else is kneeling down, they just decide not to. And for this reason, at the time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against them. Now, you always know, it says, they responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. Now, anytime you hear, anytime somebody comes to you and they immediately start with the, oh, you're so great, oh, live forever, oh, you're awesome, hey, I just wanted to talk to you, but first I want to really appreciate what you're doing, you already know that they're about to plunge the knife into somebody. They're about to go after. I supervised a lot of people for a lot of years in a retail environment. And, you know, I had my office. And every once in a while, you'd have somebody come in and, you know, they'd be like, hey, you know, your meeting this morning was really good. And I really appreciate kind of the direction that you're taking things. You know, they'd say something like that. And I already knew in my mind I was bracing myself for, all right, what are you going to tell me? Because you're, ab- you're about to go after somebody. It's a given. You know, as soon as they start with how awesome you are, you already know that they want something and it's probably to go after somebody else so that they can improve their position. That's usually the situation. And so these guys are going, oh, king, live forever. And it makes sense. These guys took their jobs. They are, you know, they're all in the Babylonian situation and they want to be in charge. They want power. These guys have the three best jobs in Babylon and they didn't bow before the king. So they see an opportunity here to take them out. And so they go to the king and they're like, hey, 
these three Jewish guys did not bow down. They did not worship. And so the king finds out, and he's enraged with the situation. He's upset. And so he has them brought before him. Now, initially, he wants to give them another chance. He really doesn't want to go after these guys. They had just interpreted the dream. They're doing a good job. He's relatively happy with them. And so he goes, hey, is it true that you do not serve my gods? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you will not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? So he throws down the gauntlet. Now, the time to decide whether you're going to be faithful to the Lord is not in the moment where you're facing it. The time to decide whether you're going to be faithful to God is not when the question gets asked. And arguably, this is a harder moment for them. You know, initially, all they did was not kneel, and nobody really said anything, and, you know, everything was good. But now they've been summoned. They've been called before the most powerful guy on earth. This is a guy that has the power to kill them, to wipe them out. He has total control. And they're standing before the most powerful ruler on the face of the earth at that time. He is the Caesar. He is the whatever. And he's looking them dead in the eye and going, hey, when you hear the music, you need to bow down. And in that moment, they have a decision to make. And it's, are they going to be faithful to what they know to be true? Or are they going to just sort of surrender? And all of us in our lives have idols that we have to face. We have distractions that lead us in the world. You know, as a culture, we don't have statues to bow down and worship anymore. In fact, when we think about an idol in the Old Testament, it sounds kind of ridiculous, right? You know, we read these stories of Asherah poles and, you know, graven images and golden calves and, you know, it sounds kind of primitive and ridiculous. Like, who would bow down and worship a statue? It just doesn't really seem to be like, I can't even contemplate that. Like at no point in my life have I ever thought to get like some trinket out and go, this is my God and worship it. Like, oh yeah, you know, I picked this up on vacation. It looks really cool. And it's my household God now. And it's kind of ridiculous. Or, you know, commissioning somebody, hey, can you cut that tree down in my yard? And I would like you to carve it into, you know, a family of elephants, and I'm going to worship them. It just sounds ridiculous. But people did. They made homemade idols. But in our modern world, every generation has golden images that they have to contend with. Every generation has idols that they have to fight. And we're no different. You know, we have money, which is an idol for so many people. You know, power privilege, position, the American dream, you know, the idea of being able to have everything, you know, maybe getting a brand new car is an idol, that anything that separates you or takes priority and precedence in your life over God is an idol. It's something that becomes more important to you than your relationship with God. And it could be, you know, you see all of these influencers now, you know, every time you go on Instagram or You know, there's always somebody on there that's trying to gain influencers, trying to gain followers, you know, taking ridiculous pictures and shooting fake videos of them, you know, getting off a private plane or, you know, on some beach that looks pristine and magnificent. But then you see a real photo of it and it's just crowded and they manage to get that one angle that makes it look like it's paradise. But then you see what it really looks like and you're like, I wouldn't want to go there. And you see all of these things and it's just, it's not real. It's all fake. Just like the idol isn't real. And it's fake. But it's a distraction and it draws us away from thinking about what's important. And as a country, our focus on God has never been further away than it is now. There was a study that came out 
about a week ago, and for the first time in American history, less than half of Americans said that they were sure, that they were absolutely sure that God existed. It's the first time ever in our country's history that less than half of America was sure that God existed. And church attendance is at an all-time low. People are not being brought up in the knowledge of the Lord. You know, people don't go to church anywhere near as much as they used to. They don't worship anywhere near as much as they used to. Attendance is down. COVID accelerated it. You know, we see lower attendance across the board in all churches. And it's easier now than it's ever been to not think about God because we live in a time where science has explained a lot of the mystery of life. You know, there are a lot of things that forever you didn't have answers for that, you know, science answers now. And so it's easy for science to become a God. And then you just have access to so much that it makes you feel like really we are the masters of everything that goes on. And we're in control. I was grilling out for Memorial Day at my house. And I started up my grill and I loaded the charcoal into it. And I bought this premium charcoal because I'd smoked briskets the week before for my Bible study. And I like when I'm doing a long smoke, this specialty hardwood that comes from South America. So I'm sitting there in my backyard with this imported South American hardwood in the middle of a heavily wooded lot. I mean, I got trees all around me. There's like 30 trees in my yard. But would I ever contemplate cutting one of those down and using it for firewood? Why would I? I can have South American charcoal imported and delivered to my house. It's ridiculous. I mean, you just think about the time that you live in. I mean, not even Solomon could have had that done a thousand or two thousand years ago. And so I've got my South American hardwood and then I get my skirt steaks out from Texas that I ordered up that were marinated. And I've got my bell peppers from California that I had brought, you know, these organic, beautiful bell peppers that I'm going to grill over the fire. And I'm getting it all going, and while I'm, you know, doing that, I'm snacking on, you know, cheese that's from Italy, you know, and sausage from Louisiana. You know, I got my cheese and sausage platter, and it's been imported. You know, and every time I'm getting a little hot, I go inside to my climate-controlled house where I've set the temperature at exactly 71 degrees. 72 is too warm. 70 is a little too cold. I like 71. That's where the humidity is perfect and where I'm the most comfortable, you know. And then I go and I get water from the refrigerator. I prefer it chilled, you know, and, you know, I'm able to set my refrigerator at the exact temperature that I like to keep my beverages. That way they're not too cold or not too warm, you know, like I'm right on the edge of freezing. And, you know, I'm the master of my entire little world there. I mean, it's easy to start to feel like, is God relevant anymore when you live in a world where you have so much control, so much absolute authority over everything? You know, I mean, a disaster in my world is the Wi-Fi went down on Memorial Day for a couple for a couple hours in the morning. Comcast had an outage until 1130, and I had to actually stream something over over my cellular network, and it wasn't in the 1080p. You know, it was more in that lower grade that they sort of throttle you with, and so it was a little grainy. You know, so as I'm watching We Were Soldiers, it's not quite as clear as I would prefer on my television. You know, this is my great suffering of the day is I'm in charge of everything around me. And in that type of world, it's easy to forget that God exists. It's easy to not think about him because there's so much distraction everywhere. There's so much to keep you busy. There's so much to keep you focused on other things. And there's so much to move you away from the thought of, you know, is there a need for God? But yet every breath I take is dictated by him. Every thought that I have needs to be put captive to him. Everything that I have, that house, the South American hardwood, the Texas skirt steak, it's all because he allowed me the resources to be able to have it. There's nothing that I own that is not his. But yet it's easy to forget that he exists. And so we all have idols to deal with. Some are real obvious. Images of gold that are like, okay, yeah, I know what that is. But some of them are a lot more insidious. And the Satan is really good at hiding in plain view, in keeping you distracted in plain view. And the time to decide whether you're going to worship the Lord when push comes to shove 
is not in the moment where you're facing the trial. But see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been faithful along the way. They didn't eat the contaminated meat. They were faithful to pray to God. They had been diligent in the small things. You can move to the next uh, slide. They had been diligent in the small things. They had been faithful along the way. And so when the time came for them to be faithful in the big thing, they were ready. And if we're faithful every day to pray, to read the word, to be in the knowledge of God, if we know who God is and we have a relationship with him, we can be ready when push comes to shove. You know, they could have opted for a whole bunch of excuses. They could have in this moment, they could have bowed down and said, you know what? Hey, look, we're, we're in Babylon. You know, we're, we're away from home. We're far away. You know, we got to live to get along. And so, you know, like when in Rome, you know, you go on vacation internationally, they always say kind of, you know, read up on the local culture, make sure you don't offend anybody, kind of know what's going on. You know, as Americans, we're really bad at that. You know, we like to show up and go, you know, what do you mean you don't have Coca-Cola? You know, what do you what do you mean you don't offer a cheeseburger? You know, we just expect that the entire world operates the way we do. But, you know, it's good to kind of know what's going on. And so they could have gone with the, oh, yeah, you know what? We're in Babylon and we got to do it. Or, God, we were coerced. You know, it was our life on the line. We didn't have a choice. Or they could have said, you know what? Hey, we've been made governors. We're in this influential position. How are we ever going to have the opportunity to witness and tell people about the one true God if we get killed? You know, so we're just going to go ahead and go along in this moment so that we have the opportunity to witness later. And that's a popular one that we like to tell ourselves. Well, you know, I'm just going to, I'll do wrong right now so that I can do right later. You know, just so I can get through this moment. But when we think of it as the ends justify the means that I'm going to do bad so that I can do right later, that's never right. Doing what is right is always the right thing to do. And we deceive ourselves when we think that doing the wrong thing to achieve the right thing later is the right answer. Because there is no deception in God. You know, it's interesting when we look at the things the Lord hates in Proverbs, lying is mentioned twice. He hates deception. Because Satan is the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. And so we trick ourselves. Or they could have gone and said, you know what, we're going to kneel down, but inside we're going to be praying, Lord, you know that we don't really, we don't believe, we're just, we're praying right now to you and we worship you, we're just, we're doing it. They could have sold themselves on any one of a many number of excuses, but they didn't. They looked at them and they didn't even need to think about it for a minute. They need, didn't need to consult, they didn't need to counsel. <coughs> They said, we do not need to give an answer concerning this matter. They were like the psalmist who says, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. They really didn't have any choice. Their faith was settled. Their faith was complete. They knew who God was. They had been raised in the knowledge of the Lord. They had a real relationship with him. And the idea of denying him now was repugnant. So much so that it would have been like Jesus going, yeah, you know what? I will fall down and worship you, Satan, and you can make me ruler of everything. Of course not. They knew who the living God was. They'd been raised in it. And they were not about to kneel down and worship a false god. And they said to him, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Come what may, they were going to stay faithful to the Lord. And being faithful to the Lord does not always mean that you get or what you get what you hope for in the moment. You know, this week we looked at Acts 13 in Bible study. Acts chapter 12, you have Peter and James both in jail, arrested. Peter gets miraculously sprung by an angel. James winds up being killed by the sword. Did God love James any less? Maybe he loved him more and decided that it was better for him to go to heaven and to get out of the earth and be able to worship with him forever. Maybe that was the better outcome. Maybe Peter was the one that lost in that situation, having to continue the work of the Lord. 
You know, so often we look at things from such a temporary, temporal perspective that we lose perspective of the fact that there is an eternal life waiting for us. And all they can do is kill the body. And so they go, we will not bow down. Whether we live or whether we die, we will not profane the name of our God. And so Nebuchadnezzar was filled with anger. His facial expression changes. And he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace up seven times more than it was usually heated. Up until this point in the story, there's been sixes everywhere. There's been six instruments, the statues and sixes. It's all the sign of man, the sign of Satan. And then all of a sudden, he orders it to be turned up seven times hotter. The number of God, the number of perfection. And you have to wonder, did they know in that moment? We don't know. But he has them bound up. He orders his soldiers to throw them into the fire. And the time is short, so much so that can move to the next one. So much so that the guys that carry them to throw them into the furnace, they get killed by the heat. The Lord wants us to fully understand that this fire is so hot that death is an outcome. The people that put them into the furnace, that didn't even go into the furnace, that were just throwing them over the edge, they get killed. That's how hot the fire was. This fire was lethal. And they get bound, and they get thrown into the fire, and they look down at them. And as Nebuchadnezzar looks down at these guys, he looks at them and he goes, weren't there three that we threw into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, certainly. And he looked back and he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Next one. And so there was a fourth man in the fire. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Jesus goes there and he is with them. And that's the thing, is that the Lord doesn't promise to keep us out of trouble. But he does promise that he'll be with us in the trouble. And that he will walk beside us. And they didn't complain, they didn't moan, they stood steadfast in their faith. And Nebuchadnezzar is looking at him, and he can't get near him. If they had not done it, If they had simply said, you know what, we're going to get along, they would have missed out on the fellowship. They would have missed out on the opportunity to have that moment with Jesus that they're going to know for the rest of their lives. And when we crack in the moment, when we lose faith, when we decide not to remain faithful to God, we miss the opportunity to have the blessing. We miss the opportunity to see the Lord move in mighty and powerful ways that we can tell people about. Because God's never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. But he's not going to show up ten minutes early and go, hey, you don't really need to worry about it. I got you. You need to stand firm in the Lord. And he will deliver you. And so Jesus is in the fire with them. And they're going and Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, come on out of there. The only thing that burns off is the rope that Nebuchadnezzar had them tied with. Their clothes don't smell like smoke. They're not singed. Their hair, they don't even smell like smoke. I grilled over the weekend. I smelled like a forest fire when I came back in the house. Just from lighting a little bit of wood. I mean, you know, it just kind of plumed at me. I had to go. Once I was done with dinner, I took a shower. You know, took my clothes off. I had to change. These guys were in a furnace. And they come out and they don't even smell like smoke. That's the power of the Lord to intervene, to suspend all the rules, to say, look, I am God. And Nebuchadnezzar looks at them and he goes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come here. And Nebuchadnezzar looks at them and says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him 
violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their god. You know, Jesus told us that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. But see, these three, they had the faith to stand. They weren't afraid. Because Jesus, because God, was real to them. It wasn't just some idea on paper. It wasn't just some random thought of, oh yeah, I think there's a God, but I don't really know him. See, they knew God. They had a relationship with him. And because they had a relationship with him, they could stand there and go, we're not going to kneel. We're not going to bend down. Because we know that God is God. And we love him and we worship him. And we are not going to betray him. We're going to stand. That is the kind of relationship that each and every one of us can have with God. A relationship so settled that when the moment comes and our faith is tested, we don't have to worry about whether God is real or God is not, whether God is going to deliver us or God is not, because we know who God is. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to us inside and going, hey, I've got this. You know, the pastor before... Dr. Gaines was a guy named Adrian Rogers. And every once in a while, I'll listen to one of his sermons. And I remember him talking during one of them, and he looked at the camera and he said, Who is Jesus? Jesus is my dearest friend. He is more real to me than you are. I talk to him far more than I talk to you. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that I love him with all of my heart. He is the Son of God who left heaven and came to this earth and suffered, bled, and died and walked out of that grave a living, risen Savior. And he's the one who sent me to tell you that he loves you and he wants to save you and he will save you today if you'll give him your heart. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was more real to them than Nebuchadnezzar standing in front of them. He talked to them. He was real to them. And they were not afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. They were not afraid of that furnace. They were not afraid of those soldiers. The only person that they feared was God, the living one. The one that Jesus says, fear God, because God can kill the soul, not just the body. And they knew that their God was faithful, that their God was able. And even if he did not choose to deliver them, that was okay. Because they would be with God in heaven. The last thing they were afraid of is anything that Nebuchadnezzar could do. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for tonight. Oh Lord, I just pray that you would dwell in our hearts richly, that you would guide us, that you would lead us, that we would draw close to you. Lord, I pray that you would be more real to each and every one of these young adults than the person sitting next to them. That they would dwell richly in a relationship with you. That we would seek you with all of our hearts. That we would spend time in prayer. That we would study your word. So that we would always be prepared to have an answer for the hope that was within us. Oh Lord, I pray that if there is someone here tonight who doesn't know you, that they have questions about Jesus, that they have questions about you, Lord, that just after the service they would come near the garage entrance, Lord, and we'll talk about the Lord. 
and we'll talk about Jesus, and we'll talk about what it means to have a relationship. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would watch over these men and women this week, that you would guide them, that you would lead them, that you would be near to them, and that they would have the faith to stand in the moment of testing, Lord. O oh Lord, I lift these prayers up to you in the matchless name of Yeshua, Messiah Jesus. Amen.